Our topic tonight may be a little bit of an obscure one, but hopefully it's going to be an interesting one. Ptolemaic cosmology, which is to say, how do we understand our model of the cosmos, the universe that we live in, and specifically in this case, how it was understood back before um, you know, Copernicus changed our thinking and now the, the uh, modern Western understanding of the universe, which is so very much changed. So if we think about our own experienced universe, how we individually experience the universe, we're each maybe at the center of our own experienced universe. And if we're going to make a map of it or whatever, we got a little dot. You are here, you are me, this is me. I'm at the middle of my own experience anyway. Around that, we maybe put a circle of friends, our close friends, a circle of our family, our home, and so on. That's in our inner circle of our experience universe. Then we have work, our neighborhood, our circle of coworkers, and so forth. Outside of that, we have maybe a circle of acquaintances, places that we occasionally visit, stores, restaurants, as now we're getting back to, anyway, restaurants and stores uh, once again. Within a wider circle is your circle of strangers that you encounter, our city or region that we wander around in but maybe don't spend as much time in as we do in the inner circles. Places where we've traveled form a wider circle, even if we maybe only have been there once or so. And finally, there are places that exist that you'll never personally visit, but nevertheless you understand that they exist through media and other uh, images and so on stories. Okay, so although our planet is at the heart of our experienced universe, we now understand that it's actually more peripheral to the universe than humans can even readily imagine. So Earth is not the center of the universe, even though it's the center of our experienced universe. Indeed, as we understand the magnitude of the solar system, Earth is kind of a little planet and it's kind of close into the sun relative to uh, the larger gas giant planets that are out there. And indeed, then the whole mass of the solar system, you know, with the different kinds of uh, the comet belts and the ice planets and so on, like Pluto that aren't real planets anymore and so on. And nevertheless, that solar system is in a neighborhood of stars that um, increasingly we find have planets around them and we've discovered all kinds of other planets and solar systems and so we understand that we're in just one little solar system among plenty of other solar systems. Uh, these are the stars that um, everybody visits in science fiction, things like uh, Vega and Sirius and so on because uh, and then they're known because, uh, anyway, that they're the closer ones that we can see, and so therefore they have names. Uh, nevertheless, you probably, uh, because those stars in a lot of cases that are close by and are bright, like Vega or something, they're much less likely to have um, planets that are habitable in the same way that we understand that the Earth is, because different kind of star and so forth. Nevertheless, Vegans are where a lot of times where people are from, the aliens are Vegans and so forth. All right, that those little grouping of stars, though, that are nearby to us, relatively nearby to us, um, is just the tiniest fraction of the stars that are in our Milky Way galaxy, which is impossibly uh, large to comprehend. And so when, you know, a science fiction like um, Isaac Asimov com contemplates a uh, galactic empire and so on. Um, he kind of is writing those stories um, long before people really had a sense of how big the galaxy is. Um, and so even though maybe he has a little bit of a sense of it, just the idea of it, the magnitude of how many stars and so on, um, it's really hard for us to even grasp, you know, how immense uh, just our own little galaxy is. Much less the fact that it's only one galaxy. And so in the local galactic group, there's all of these galaxies. We know the Magellanic Clouds and so on, and the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, which we can kind of see, obviously, as a close galaxy that is similar to the Milky Way Galaxy. And so often, um, 
again, in science fiction, aliens are going to come from Andromeda to conquer our galaxy. It's a pretty long way to get for them to get here, actually. <laughs> okay, but our local galactic group is just part of a super cluster of galactic galaxies uh, and you know where this is going in other words that group of galaxies there's so many more galaxies in the super cluster the super cluster itself is only one of the super clusters that we can identify all around us and these are all now galaxies not stars you know that we're seeing you know to the point where we get to the observable universe um, that is not the the known universe but the observable universe of some you know, 46.5 billion light years uh, across, and which uh, with the Hubble telescope has found like two trillion, or actually that number keeps going up, how many uh, galaxies that we've been able to um, identify. And so again, despite the fact of how many, we just think of again, how big our solar system is, how little our planet is in it, how many solar systems there are in a galaxy, how many galaxies there are, it starts to be pretty crazy how immense uh, the cosmos is compared to how anybody would have ever imagined it just a few hundred years ago. All right, so all of that that we're even seeing in terms of the components of our universe, we're really looking at um, things that we can see and detect in terms of like atomic matter and so on. And so that's still only like 5% of what we know makes up the universe uh, with much larger percentage taking uh, can be composed of both dark matter and dark energy. So in other words, uh, there's other components of this that are even more vast than what we can uh, see and observe uh, and experience in this in in the kind of way that we even tend to think about. And of course, because of that dark energy, uh, we have found out that the universe is expanding and it's actually expanding at an accelerated rate. And so this diagram here represents essentially uh, the universe starting at a big bang and moving out timeline wise uh, to the right. And essentially this massive rapid expansion when everything is changing at, at an incredible rate at the very beginning and then things are slowed down. Uh, but as the universe is continuously expanding that expansion actually uh, accelerates. Okay, the age of the universe, you know, some almost 14 billion years old. And where, if there was a Big Bang, where did that happen? Where is the center of the universe? So we once thought the Earth was the center, and then the Sun we thought was the center, and so on. Uh, now that we see this giant observable universe and everything like that, where did that Big Bang take place? Where's the leftover remnant of that? Well, it turns out the universe has no center. <laughs> so this um, is also very hard for, I think, any of us to really even think about uh, in terms of um, just getting our head around how all of this all works. But the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, which is, means to say it's uniform in all orientations. And so on all scales, larger than superclusters, which means that there is no center. So the universe is all expanded out and is expanding from itself and each other. Okay, so in the past, <laughs> now as we kind of look, that's how we understand it now. Um, and that is changing very rapidly, actually. Um, all, a lot of those questions uh, back when I was in uh, junior high school and taking uh, you know, junior high school astronomy, a lot of these questions, is the universe expanding or is it, is it maybe expanding and going to alternative between expansion and contraction and so on, those were still open questions. Um, and a lot of this, a lot of those numbers have all be given a lot more precision just in the last couple of decades. So this is a, a field of science that is um, uh, where our understanding is rapidly changing. But anyway, deciding, you know, if, um, if we were going to ask, well, where is the center of the universe? For ancient people, uh, the saying that there is no center, that was not the obvious answer. <laughs> that is not probably uh, what they would have immediately jumped to. Um, there were instead kind of two obvious answers to the question, what's the center of the universe? And those are, of course, the Earth and the Sun. So while the place we're standing, in other words, the Earth, a geocentric universe, that may seem like 
the sole obvious answer, actually ancient theologians and philosophers had reason to consider the sun as a candidate for the universe's center. So there were uh, folks in antiquity who were positing the idea that the universe was heliocentric, which is to say centered on the sun as opposed to geocentric, centered on the earth. So this is a modern engraving we have of Claudius Ptolemy, a very famous um, ancient astronomer who we're going to be talking about a lot tonight. So um, the two, these two systems then um, that we tend to talk about, the one is the geocentric universe, the other is the heliocentric universe, and we also call these by shorthand the Ptolemaic system and the Copernican system. So the one named for Ptolemy and the other named for Copernicus. Um, these are, um, they're not the only two people. So Copernicus was hardly the first person to theorize a heliocentric universe, um, but he was the first person who was actually able to demonstrate it and, and therefore popularize it. Uh, in the same way, Ptolemy is coming actually at the end of a long uh, set of people going back to including Aristotle, who um, uh, concluded that the earth was at the center of the universe, but Ptolemy crafted a system in such a way um, that it ends up being named for him. Okay, so if we go back um, into antiquity and what people were able to observe with so much less technology and so forth, what you had with ancient observations and limited instruments and so forth, most ancient people viewed the sky or the heavens as the realm of the gods or of God and in a heliocentric universe, therefore then the divine is then at the center of the universe. So um, a lot of, for a lot of people and a lot of ancient peoples, a sun god uh, was actually like Ra in Egypt and so forth, uh, Apollo and, uh, and Helios, now Helios isn't as big a god, but anyway, Apollo is a, a, another sun god in the Greeks. Um, the sun is an important, a very important god uh, for ancient people. And if, as, as uh, ancient philosophers and natural philosophers were um, positing how the universe worked, um, it might be tempting to want to say, well, this important um, thing that we observe, the sun, is actually at the center of our universe. Um, if I, on the other hand, if we posit that the earth where we're standing is the center of a universe, in other words, there's a spherical earth, then what ends up being at the very center of the, of the universe is the underworld. So Hades or hell actually cop, occupies the most center place of the, the universe. And that maybe seemed odd or unfortunate. Why would... Um, what's generally thought of as being not the realm of the good gods, but rather uh, the realm of evil and so forth. Why would that be at the heart of the universe, right? Also for heliocentrism, so the sun is a source of light and heat and hence life. Philosophers had good reason to kind of favor heliocentrism. That makes sense. The sun is uh, causing this. And we've said before when we've done, done lectures on Plato, Plato has an analogy of the sun where he likens the physical sun to the form of the good, which is to say Plato's idea, uh, ultimate idea of what is at the heart of, and of truth in the universe. So in the physical, the lesser physical reality for Plato, um, the sun functioned that way as sort of the source of light and heat and so forth uh, for the for him, uh, less important physical world than the world of ideas, which are centered, though, by analogy. The good is essentially analogous to the sun. So he, or, uh, that anyway, so, so Plato, anyway, is arguing very much in favor of sun being very important. And of course, what is very important to all life. The Pythagoreans believed, for example, that the Earth was not at the universe's center, and a heliocentric model was proposed by Aristarchus of Samos in the third century BC. And though, despite the fact that Plato was attracted to a lot of Pythagorean ideas, he and Aristotle also had some good reasons, though, for rejecting heliocentrism in favor of geocentrism. So, for example, 
Um, one of the things uh, that we can observe, and you can observe this uh, by looking at the night sky and doing, um, you know, doing a little bit of geometry. So there is no, what is called a parallax, there's no observed parallax in the fixed stars. So if we see this um, kind of diagram, you can see kind of like if we believe in a heliocentric universe, so the sun there is at the center and the earth is going around the sun in a circle, then when um, you are looking, for example, uh, at, at, at one of the moving planets against the backdrop of the stars that don't move. So in other words, uh, as far as you're concerned, if you're, if you, we know about planets and we know where the planets are and so on. We know what stars and so forth. Uh, but if you don't have all of the information that we have and instead you're just out in the night sky and looking, the planets more or less look like stars that move around. So the morning star, Venus, the evening star is also Venus. Um, it's there at different times and it's not always in the same place because it moves around. So the idea is if Earth is actually moving around the sun and we're seeing the different places uh, from different perspectives, um, the, the stars would have to be just insanely far away, ridiculously far away, for them not to show a parallax. In other words, to have them not be moving against the backdrop. And so nobody believed it was possible that the stars could be that far away. <laughs> and so geometry here just seemed to be proving um, that uh, the, universe couldn't, the universe couldn't be heliocentric. There's also a bunch of arguments for a static Earth. So for example, we don't seem to observe the Earth moving. Um, this is a map of the known world from Ptolemy's geography in addition to being um, an amazingly important uh, late Roman or Roman uh, um, uh, astronomer. Ptolemy is also uh, an amazing uh, geographer uh, who when his works were rediscovered in the early modern times, um, really kind of set off a new era of cartography in, um, again, Western thought too. So Ptolemy had a couple uh, places where he was very important. So this is one of Ptolemy's um, maps or a map reconstructed from his kind of coordinate geographies. And you can kind of see how, how pretty good it is. So this is what would have been known about the known world to the Romans. And you can kind of see in the upper um, left-hand quadrant, the Mediterranean, uh, Spain and Europe, and, and, and you can see Italy and Greece and Turkey and so on, the Black Sea. And so that is kind of the area that they would have all known because they're, they're you know, the Romans and the Greco-Roman world, same thing. So Ptolemy based in um, Alexandria, so you can see Egypt and Arabia there and Persia and so on. That's all pretty good. Uh, the Indian Ocean, though, then, in Ptolemy's view, he believed that it was an enclosed sea like the Mediterranean. Um, and by the time you get over kind of into India there, you can see they didn't really know what was going on too much. <laughs> so in other words, uh, they had been to, Alexander had been to the borders of India, <coughs> excuse me, and there were contacts with people in India in terms of merchants and so forth, uh, but what's beyond that, they really didn't really know at that point. Okay, so why don't we observe the Earth moving if the Earth is moving? So if the world is turning at a high rate towards the east, philosophers ask, why is there no steady breeze coming from the east? If the Earth were rotating, wouldn't objects at the top of a tower have a greater eastward motion than those at the bottom of the tower? And therefore, if you dropped an object, would it not only fall eastward relative to the tower, but no such deflection is observed. So in other words, we're not seeing that kind of a deflection. And so that said to um, uh, philosophers who had no ideas about, uh, anyway, modern uh, uh, conceptions of inertia and so on, we didn't have those uh, laws of motion that we have from Newton. And so as a result of this, they weren't able to explain why uh, we couldn't observe anything that the Earth is moving if the Earth is moving. So Aristotle had a theory of motion um, prior to Newton. And Aristotle argued, for example, that it's the nature of heavy, solid objects to seek the center of the universe. 
which is to say the center of the Earth. The Earth is at the center of the universe. And for light objects like gases and fire to rise. So therefore, in Aristotle's understanding, if you shoot a cannonball, you're causing unnatural motion. So it's a big, hard, heavy thing. It doesn't want to go into the air, but it fall, and that's why it falls back down. Um, and so prior to Newton in modern times in the 17th century, there was no explanation of a theory of motion that would explain a heliocentric universe. So we don't have gravitation, we don't have those kind of theories, and so how do we understand why heavy objects are falling to Earth? Why wouldn't they all be falling to the sun, the center of the universe, right? So let's get into Ptolemy. So Claudius Ptolemy is a second century Roman citizen from the Greek city of Alexandria in Egypt. So Alexandria continued to be in a very important center of learning um, even after Egypt uh, was incorporated into the Roman Empire. So Ptolemy is not related to the royal Ptolemies. <laughs> so um, you're probably uh, maybe aware anyway that all of the Greek kings of the, um, of the Hellenistic kingdom of Egypt were all named Ptolemy. And then usually the, um, the queens were named either uh, Berenike or Cleopatra. So the last of the Ptolemies was Queen Cleopatra, uh, the famous Cleopatra. Uh, anyway, he has the same name as the Ptolemies, the royal Ptolemies, but he's not related to them. He is an astronomer and astrologer a uh, geographer and a mathematician, and he's credited with the Ptolemaic system, but as I mentioned, the system had already existed. It went all the way back to Aristotle and Hipparchus, but Ptolemy really, um, really systemizes it and works out the kinks, as we'll show. So Ptolemy is the author of a book which we know um, modernly as the Almagest, so Almagest is the anglicized or English version of a title that the Arabs gave it. Uh, Arabic Almagesti, which is to say the Arabic of the Greek word <laughs> Magisti or greatest. And so the um, Arabs, uh, Arab science, as we saw even in the last lecture, we were talking about how uh, influential um, Muslim thinking was on um, the history of Christian, uh, you know, both philosophy and universities and everything like that. Uh, in the same way, um, uh, the, this intellectual flowering in mathematics and philosophy and so forth uh, happened in the Islamic world, you know, a couple generations before it came back into the West. And so in a lot of cases, Greek thought transmitted uh, through Islam to then uh, the Latin West. And so the book, though, when it go, if we take it back to antiquity, ancient Greece and the uh, Roman world, it's originally called the Mathematica Syntaxis, and so it was preserved in the Muslim world and translated into Latin twice in the 12th century. When that happened, it had an enormous impact on astronomy and on science in general. So, um, so we'll look here then. What, what are the Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos? So for ancient, medieval, and early modern people, there simply was no difference between what we now think of as astronomy and astrology. Um, those have now diverged very, uh, very completely, but in ancient and medieval times, they were the same thing. Uh, one word was used entirely for the other. Um, it was clear from the relationship, for example, between the moon and the tides that celestial objects had effects in the terrestrial sphere. So the moon is um, moving around, and as it moves around, that affects uh, the tides, which are a very observable thing. So somehow, celestial motion is causing force at a distance. You know, they, again, they don't have um, a theory of gravitation and so forth. And, but they are, at the very least, seeing that things moving around in the heavens have effects on Earth. And so Ptolemy wrote four books, which are called the Tetrabiblos, which became essentially the canon um, uh, for astrology in the ancient world and Middle Ages. So as I say, it was preserved in the Arab world. 
The primary interest in astronomy among Christians, Muslims, and Jews was astrological. So people were very interested in uh, leaders, you know, always had a uh, need to predict the future. Are they going to win a battle? Is, is it, um, you know, a propitious day for this or that to happen and so on? What's going to, what is their future? Everybody is always interested in those kind of things. So that kind of divination. However, there were also some practical needs for astronomy. So for example, Christians needed a little bit of astronomy and some mathematics to calculate the date of Easter. <laughs> Seems like that very should be just a simple thing, but actually when is Easter supposed to happen? And so there's a, a kind of a complex formula uh, involving um, you know, the phases of the moon and so forth about when, when Easter occurs. And, it's, and when you just have to decide when Easter is, because essentially as a movable feast, it's called, uh, that moves around the calendar. So it's not just like Christmas, which is always on December 25th. It's on a particular Sunday that moves, as we know. And when it moves, though, it also moves the entire period of Lent that goes before it. So all of the other Christian holidays that are leading up to Easter, and then it also moves uh, Pentecost that comes after it, which is 50 days after. And so as a result of um, needing to know when Easter is, that actually affects your entire religious calendar, which is your life calendar uh, in the antiquity in the Middle Ages. Uh, Muslims, meanwhile, they don't have Easter, but they used astronomy in order to determine the latitude and the direction to Mecca. So it was important in Muslim daily prayer, uh, and wherever they were going to have a mosque and wherever, if you don't have a mosque, if you're going to do your daily prayers, you need to be facing in the direction of Mecca. And so you need a little bit of astronomy and geography in order to uh, use from the stars to determine where, um, which direction Mecca is in. Okay, so what is in the Almagest? What are the contents? So the Almagest explains that the Earth is a motionless sphere surrounded by moving celestial spheres. So although um, uh, there's a modern myth uh, in, about Columbus, that Columbus was setting out to prove the world was round and that his um, sailors all were going to rebel against him because um, they thought that they were getting to the edge of a flat earth and they were afraid that they were going to uh, sail over the edge or something like that. And that's not true at all. Uh, that's a modern myth. Actually, people in antiquity and all through the Middle Ages understood that the world is a sphere. So the Earth is a motionless sphere, though. So in other words, it's not rotating or revolving or anything like that. It's sitting there. And everything that's happening that's in motion are the celestial spheres that are moving around it. So the Almagest successfully described all of the apparent motions of celestial objects as observed from Earth. So it included a catalog of 1,022 stars, the locations uh, of those, and of 48 constellations. Um, and you could use in the uh, antiquity and also the Middle Ages, our millery spheres uh, in invented by Aristosthenes and used until the invention of telescope to determine celestial positions. Okay. So observing the fixed stars. So if you've probably seen one of these, if you get a time-lapse image, um, uh, the stars that don't, they all move together, right? Apparently, uh, the Earth is actually mo moving, we understand now, but it seemed to uh, people who felt that the Earth was not moving, that it was the stars that are moving. And if you, uh, if, you know, were to sit there and watch them all night, go all around in a circle, because as you know, the Earth moves like that in a day. And so that's, and the center there is the, the pole star, the North Star Polaris. Okay, so um, if you have in Ptolemy's catalog, he has all of the, uh, the constellations that we still know. And then he talks about the seven planets that are uh, observable from the Earth with the naked eye. Uh, the planets include the sun and the moon, so those are both understood to be planets. Planet means moving star. Um, now we have a different definition of what planet is. So the planets observed, though, to be moving through a very particular uh, uh, plane of the ecliptic, which is a set of the constellations which uh, we know as the zodiac constellations. And so that's why the zodiac constellations are important, and they're also why they're important to astrology in addition to 
um, observable astronomy like this. Okay. So in a geocentric cosmos, like I say, the Earth itself is a sphere that isn't moving at the center of it. And then there are seven planets set in celestial spheres in order around the Earth. So the lowest or closest planet to the Earth is the Moon, then Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, and then Saturn. And then finally, the outermost of the celestial spheres is, what, is the one in which all of the fixed stars, the constellations, are all set. And so they could tell, um, when you look at how this kind of works, you could tell that um, the moon is closest, which they're quite right about, because uh, the other planets could go behind the moon, right? <laughs> And so we were able to, they were able to tell that through observation. They're also able to see um, that happening between, with uh, Mercury and Venus, which could have transits, right, of the, uh, anyway, for, for, for the sun. So in other words, they're in a different place. We know that those two are actually between us and the sun, and they understood it that way from a geocentric cosmos as well. However, <laughs> there is a big problem with this system. If the system is perfect, like the stars are supposed to be perfect, if everything is going in, in perfect uh, divine circles, like it should be, um, the problem is at a certain moments in time, um, the planets do really weird things. And so if you're just looking here on the right, on the flat, um, it's night sky, and you're just observing night after night. Mars, on the one hand, is going to have been going in this kind of same nice even path along the zodiac and so forth. But then at a certain point, it turns itself around and starts going back. And you'll see there at point two, three, and four. And then it stops going backwards and then it reverses itself and it starts going forward again. And so why does it have retrograde motion? Um, we now know um, and you can see from our heliocentric universe what's happening here, the Sun and the Earth and Mars, as the Earth is moving along and Mars is moving along at a different rate, um, the, the vision of Mars or the location of Mars against the backdrop of the faraway stars uh, changes because of the relative position of Earth and Mars in the heliocentric sphere. And so how is that happening? How does that explainable, though, in, in the and a geocentric system. So the actual cause, you know, the Earth orbits the Sun at a different speed than the other planets, and also causing problems, the orbits aren't actually perfect circles, but ellipses. And so we are continuously seeing retrograde motion uh, if you're just looking at it from what you would be doing if you, I mean, we don't have satellites, and you don't have uh, another, another place to observe other than just looking out from the night sky. Okay. So the Ptolemaic explanation for the observed motion of the planets against the fixed stars used what he calls, what Ptolemy calls, epicycles. So instead of having the planet actually be on the circle itself, the sphere itself that is going around the Earth, it's actually on a sub-sphere. Um, and so it is circling around an epicycle and so then from the Earth, it has these weird motions where there is a retrograde motion uh, that can be explained by the epicycle. Um, so a solution then is adding epicycles. So the universe here is a little more complicated than I first drew it. So now we have those same uh, seven spheres of the planets, but the planets are not actually on the sphere. They're on the additional epicycles there. They're moving around, right? So then there's an additional fix that Ptolemy has in order to make things um, actually work the way so that he could mathematically explain all of the observable uh, inconsistencies. And those are adding deference, equants, and eccentrics. So now, um, rather than understanding the Earth as being the exact center of these circles, the center is an eccentric between the equant and the Earth. In other words, the, the sphere is, is going around and is orbiting not specifically the Earth, but it is actually a little off from that. So the deference angular rate is only constant when viewed from the eccentric, 
the eccentric is the midpoint between the equinox and the Earth, and then the epicycles angular rate is only constant when viewed from the equant. <laughs> so, all right. So anyway, it is a little bit of a complicated system, but the remarkable thing, or the exciting thing, or the amazing thing is that once this was all plugged in, um, you could completely uh, describe, Ptolemy was able to describe the observable data. So he was able to create a system, and by doing this, um, as you would observe where the planet would be at any given time, this was able to be explained using um, this, this kind of complicated system. Okay, so um, people, astronomers, and well, who are also astrologers through the Middle Ages and then even into early modern times, um, very much understood uh, that you had to be using these kind of, what we kind of maybe think of as mathematical tricks of epicycles and equants and so forth, in order to actually get the um, observable data to actually work with the model. And so in fact, when uh, Copernicus is first working out uh, his model for a, a heliocentric universe, he also found that it didn't quite work, everything worked with just perfect circles and everything like that. And so there was actually an idea of that, well, there was maybe epicycles in here too. And so initially, uh, to explain kind of the, some of the similar problems um, of between the observational data and um, why, uh, let's say, it, why, why it didn't work with perfect circles, uh, they instead were tried to explain it with epicycles. Okay, so what's amazing is then the capacity of Ptolemy's system to explain observational data allowed it to hold sway for some 1,200 years. The sun um, was displaced from its perch at the universe's center much more quickly. So uh, once Copernicus' system was understood, and in other words, everyone understood that the sun was the center of the universe, um, they, we pretty quickly understood, wait a second, the sun is not actually the center. The sun is merely the center of our solar system. So as irrelevant as Earth is to the centerless, unimaginably enormous, observable universe, we may still be on the verge of seeing the universe itself as just a minute component of an intimate, I'm sorry, in an infinite multiverse. So maybe in addition to the amazingly vast universe that is observable and that we understand ourselves to be experiencing. It's also possible that there's actually an infinite number of multiverses that we are actually a part of. So one of the things then we should ask, or what I, one of the reasons why um, I thought it was worth uh, spending time going through and taking a look at this very um, different way that people viewed the cosmos for 1,200 years anyway, um, and up until quite recently in time, what effect will the new cosmology have on our own individual worldviews? How does this affect you know, our little map here that I started out with, our own sort of Ptolemaic circles uh, of experience with us at the center? And so, um, that's uh, it was a short lecture, kind of a, a maybe obscure topic, hopefully an interesting topic. Um, hopefully uh, that sparked some interest and there's been some comments or questions and we'll let uh, Leandro tell me if there are <laughs> or if people just found this to be, oh, okay, that was weird, that's interesting, but I hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> I'll get some water while we do. Uh, Thumper asks, would maps have mostly focused on trade routes? Uh, the answer to that is no. <laughs> Actually, um, for most of uh, time, 
uh, maps have not been used for that. Um, and so actually um, the maps that, uh, well Ptolemy, Ptolemy's maps are probably the one, the one you're thinking of here. Um, uh, Ptolemy's maps are, I'm trying to think of what it, what it is especially doing, it would be much more of a, um, it's more like a survey map and it would be like a survey map of the provinces of the Roman Empire where essentially what you do is you would say, here's Macedonia, these are the cities of Macedonia, these are the, um, these are the geographical longitude and latitude, the coordinates of, of those towns. And that's how Ptolemy's work was. It's actually very different from almost all other maps or all other Roman maps that the Romans would have had at the time. Um, the maps are primarily, um, primarily in, the, in Rome and in the Middle Ages, uh, world pictures, which are essentially, um, uh, they go along effectively with like an encyclopedia. You want to see what, um, like a picture that's giving you a picture of how the world works, uh, and it isn't actually used for uh, trade. The um, exception to that started to be in two, in two different ways. In the central Middle Ages, um, what's called a, a Portolano chart was developed, and so it is a, um, a, a tradition, um, a kind of mapping that is for um, uh, sea, sea merchants, and so that would, it's, it's a way, it's, it's not for trade routes, but it's for navigating the Mediterranean specifically. Uh, and so that is a kind of map that our, some of our modern maps evolved out of, the Portland charts. Um, and then what they would have had instead of um, a map in terms of a trade route is you would have an itinerary list. And so what you would do is, um, if you're on the Roman road, Roman road network, um, you would have a list of all of the different towns that are on road by road. And so when you get to one town, you, you know, know that the next town you're going to is this and so forth. And so you don't actually even use a map. You use effect, essentially you would use a, um, uh, uh, to how, um, you use a, a itinerary and it's usually a list as opposed to a map. So our modern universe where we just use maps like everywhere and we're all looking at maps constantly on our phone and everything like that, this is a very new universe to be in where we're thinking of everything in terms of maps. Okay. Um, so how exactly did Aristarchus speculate that the earth was moving? Well, so in order to... Um, if you're going to, in order to understand that the uh, if the sun is at the center of the universe, then um, you have to uh, then you would then you have to start to have a speculate anyway about the motion of the Earth that is how we understand the Earth to be moving relative to the sun, right? And so the Earth moves relative to the sun in like two ways: it's both uh, revolving around the sun and it's also rotating on its own axis. And so it's a lot of it's a lot. Um, it's a lot to, for people to swallow, you know, because again, they aren't, um, you're not observing any of that motion. Uh, and so, um, but anyway, that's how you have to, you have to explain it. It's almost like having to come up again with uh, both a cycle and an epicycle, because you have to come up with both the revolution and the rotation in order to, in order to make it happen. Um, and so it was always a difficult um, uh, you know, argument for natural philosophers to try to make until, um, again, we had um, the specifically uh, the Newtonian physics to explain how the motion is working. Um, it's still the the two theories were still um, sort of both open because they could both still. Uh, the observational data fit both of them. So even after Copernicus uh, illustrated the system, it isn't proven until, um, until we have Newton's laws of motion that explain why it can happen. Uh, and so those had to displace, um, again, the Aristotelian concept of motion that is, for example, heavy things are trying to be drawn to the center of the universe, which is the Earth. Uh, and so that would be how. So Paige McLaughlin says, can you describe how this picture of the cosmos also went with the four elements and the humor theory of medicine. Wow. <laughs> um, yes. So, um, so it is kind of hand in hand. It's part of the same um, universal theory or understanding of how the cosmos works. And so, um, so as you're talking about here, uh, the four elements. So air, earth, fire, and water, and some cases also um, 
So quintessence, which just means the fifth element. So sometimes there is also the fifth element of ether that is just the celestial element that we don't actually get participate in on Earth, but is up in the celestial spheres. But whether or not there's a quintessence, there's the four, the four elements. And so, um, uh, again, Earth is the heaviest element and it wants to go to the center of the universe the most, then water, then uh, air, and then fire wants to get you know, to be up with the heavens most. And so the heavens are fiery in that way. And so, um, and so those are fit very much into this um, cosmology, which again had the heavy elements at the center of the sphere, right? Uh, and they want to go that way. Their, na their nature brings them to want to be that way. Um, in terms of the, the humor theory of Madison, so, um, so then there's... Um, this is also then, you know, in how um, it, it's also intertwined. So, uh, given that there's understanding is that, um, and, and I have to, I, I have to refresh on exactly how which which one you know what are all your choleric or your your sanguine. In other words, you have the different humors. The humors are based on whether, um, uh, let's say, in between. Um, Earth and uh, water is dampness. You, you're maybe experiencing too much dampness. And, uh, and so in other words, it is totally related. I'm not, I'm not articulating it very well, but definitely I would say that, it's, it, it, that Galen and the um, humor theory of medicine is entirely um, built on the same elements and it's also interrelated with uh, with the cosmos, because actually also, uh, again, astro astrologically, the understanding is is that the the planets are also affecting all of those things. You know, so your humors are out of tune because of motions of the celestial spheres as well. So, um, MD asks, why wasn't the heliocentric universe looked on favorably by the church, since the the view that the world is geocentric is quite uh, self-centered and not God-centered. So, um, so there, it, it wasn't as unfavorably viewed by the church as, as you might think. So we're going to talk about this Galileo um, story uh, next. So one of the reasons uh, kind of why, ironically, um, uh, at, the, at the time when we finally get to like Galileo and the church there, is um, that the church had become very wedded to Aristotle by that time. And so uh, we were just doing um, a lecture the other day on, on Plato and Christianity, and there was a lot of um, hesitance uh, on the church when, when Aristotle first started um, getting, making its way back in, into the Latin West uh, via the Muslim sources and so on. Um, and there were a lot of... Uh, churchmen who felt that Aristotle was um, not compatible, right? But by the time we get to um, the later uh, scholastics, um, by the time the universities, you know, are, you know, people like Galileo are challenging the, the scholastic system at that point, uh, Aristotle is really embedded. And so they're very committed to it. And until they had, um, like I say, a new theory of motion, it couldn't explain why um, uh, why uh, everything why everything moved the way it did. Why do rocks you know fall to the ground when you drop them? Why does uh, fire uh, you know the smoke go up and everything like that? Until we had um, you know the theory of gravity and the theory of motion, um, those that really wasn't explainable. And so the church actually um, had scientists, uh, and they were looking at the evidence. They could see that the observable data fit both. Uh, so in other words, both models worked, but the heliocentric model, the Copernican model, um, there was no uh, accompanying theory of motion to explain it. And so at the best, we should, uh, the jury should be out on it. Um, uh, it is not um, largely, though, a lot of times people say, well, it's because of um, you know, like a literal reading of the Bible and Bible verses being read in a particular way. Um, that's, we'll see next week when we talk about the Galileo story, actually um, that same verse 
and the Bible was read by Galileo uh, to argue on behalf of a um, of a heliocentric universe. Um, so it's it's a, a more complicated story than than you usually think. What I'd say is it's mostly because um, it hadn't been proved by the time when the church was still quite opposed to it, uh, and then later it was also because of a um, just very um, wedded to Aristotle, the church had become. Uh, Michelangelo Sanchez says, is it true that people thought of the planets were located on glass spheres and that's why uh, the stars twinkled? So, so we, that's certainly one of the ways people looked at it. And so the celestial spheres, um, whether they're glass, they're, 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 they're invisible. Uh, and so that, or, and so maybe, like you say, the, the motion of them as they're continuously moving, that that's causing the background stars to be obscured in different kinds of ways. That would have been a theory that people would have had. Um, he also says, would you say the advancements in science like astronomy are mainly a problem of technology, like only when the instruments like the telescopes advance can more correct theories develop? Um, well, it definitely, uh, it definitely uh, helped, <laughs> you know, so one of the reasons why Galileo became so convinced of this is that, um, you know, he was a very avid user of, you know, these kind of new instrumentation. Um, he's a guy who, um, you know, there found out we had only known about, because we, because we could only see what was observable with our eyes, suddenly he's got this telescope that he's pointing at things, he's pointing to Jupiter, and he finds out there are four more movable planets that are moving around Jupiter. And so he finds the Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, and, and he's able to see, well, wait a second, this is making the, um, this is making the universe more complicated, because now Jupiter's got little planets that are going around it. Um, and so um, it's potentially arguing for a more complex system no matter what. Uh, also, before there had been a real sense that everything in the heavens is perfect. And so people wanted the heavens to be, everything to be circles. <laughs> um, and they wanted, uh, you know, the sun to be a perfect circle and the moon. But once you got the telescope out, you see the moon is you can kind of tell the moon has got some weird blotchy stuff just by looking at, your, at it with your naked eye. But once you see with the telescope, you see there's a bunch of, um, let's say, disfiguring components to the moon that are making it not this perfect um, glistening per sphere. And again, Galileo uh, hurting his eyes, looking at the sun and finding uh, sunspots and things like that, um, shows that even the sun has got a bunch of modelly blotches and so forth. And so, um, so, so those advances, those advances in um, uh, in instrumentation, that really was a, um, in a, I mean, a game changer for all of these theories. Um, before that, there had we got really to the limit of what you could do with naked eye um, observation. So, um, kind of a little bit before Galileo, there's this guy Tycho Brahe, who's a uh, naked eye astronomer, who just did, an, you know, got amazing data. Um, that hadn't really existed uh, before. And that allowed um, essentially there to be, um, you know, the two models to be kind of tested because you're able to show he's got all the data, you can show it against the, um, the prediction of the uh, Ptolemaic model, the prediction against the Copernican model, uh, and that you finally have the um, you finally have the observation data that you can trust so you can, you can plug in and take a look at it. So that also is helpful. Ron Wagner asks, when did they come up with the elliptical orbits? Um, so it's, uh, it, I, I have to remember the exact, how the Copernicus story works, but I think it's with Copernicus and Kepler, um, and they realize that, uh, that the orbits don't work if you make it be circles, but if you realize that they're actually ellipses, um, and then they, um, that they come up, realize some, some principles as they're, they're um, uh, you know, as they're drawing out or whatever, once you once you do the math and find that they're ellipses, uh, then uh, then the math works. So it's shortly after uh, Copernicus got going. Fastball Flake says, uh, John, as a man of maps yourself, what do you personally think is the most fascinating of the ancient maps um, that has an interesting history? Um, 
there are <laughs> there are so many very interesting maps. Um, so one of the really most um, fascinating maps that we have is the that's called the Poitinger table, um, and it is an actual survive. It's almost an actual surviving Roman map, and it's a map of the Roman road network, and it is. Uh, it is not a map that is, um, let's say, we think of maps as being coordinated, you know, geographically coordinated and so on. This has nothing to do with um, like north-south locations. It, if it's drawn and stretched out, it's like, you know, very short and then it goes very long for the whole Roman Empire. And what it is actually is a map of the Roman road network. Um, and it survived the ancient Roman map um, uh, survived up into the Central Middle Ages when some medieval monks um, copied it and copied it really good. And so we have a, a medieval copy of the thing. We don't have the original, which would have been very hard pressed for a manuscript to survive that long. Um, but it's a pretty remarkable artifact uh, to have survived because we have very few um, um, ancient, we know the Romans had maps and we have a couple other artifacts where um, you know, where the map of Rome on a stone table and so forth that have survived. Um, but this is one that's it's really interesting and it also um, shows that the Romans used and thought of maps differently than we do. All right, <laughs> it was a bit of an obscure topic, hopefully still an interesting one. Um, and it fits into some of what we've been talking about as we've been talking about uh, kind of the history of like thought in the West. And now um, it'll, I think, lead us into uh, the lecture we'll have next week, which is with this, this Galileo story that um, we were sort of prompted to. So we'll talk about that next week. Looking forward to it. <laughs>